Hi again, everybody. This is the second unit on propagation using specialized storage organs. In the previous unit, you learned that specialized storage organs include bulbs, combs, rhizomes, stem tubers, and root tubers. These are all produced either underground or at soil level. You should be aware that some orchid species produce aerial storage organs called pseudobulbs, but we're not gonna be covering those in this class. I just want you to be aware of these organs and that they can be used for propagating orchids. In this unit, we're going to focus on the ways in which we can use specialized storage organs for propagation. By the end of this unit, you'll be familiar with the main techniques that are used for the vegetative propagation of plants using specialized storage organs. Most geophytes can be grown from seed, but the juvenile period can be up to seven years, depending on the species. Also, seed isn't an appropriate propagation method for hybrid cultivars because the plants grown from, from seed won't come true to the parent. So vegetative techniques have to be used for these plants. Tissue culture is used for the rapid multiplication of new cultivars and for the production of virus-free stock. But traditional vegetative propagation techniques are still used for many geophytes. For bulbs and corms, traditional vegetative techniques reduce the juvenile period compared to growing from seed, but they're labor intensive and don't produce as many propagules as seed would. Let's start by looking at the true bulbs. There are several propagation techniques that are used with bulbs, including separation, scoring, scooping, chipping, and twin scaling. And we're going to take a closer look at these. On the right, you can see a picture of the cormus plant, Crocus satibus, which grows to about 10 inches tall. And this is the plant that saffron is derived from. And it's amazing to think that 200,000 stigmas have to be handpicked from this plant, from 70,000 crocus flowers, in order to produce just one pound of saffron. Many bulbs, including daffodils and tulips, which are pictured on the far right here, self-propagate vegetatively by producing offsets, and these can easily be separated from the mother bulb. The number of offsets produced varies between species and sometimes between cultivars, and it may be several years before offsets bloom. Daffodils and tulips are both propagated commercially by separating the offsets. Bulbs are field grown, allowed to bloom, then lifted mechanically, cleaned, sorted into size grades, packaged and shipped. Bulbs that don't meet the size requirements for sale are replanted. Much of this process is automated, as you'll see when you watch the video in Canvas on bulb production in the Netherlands. Some growers also optimize their income by taking a cut flower crop from the bulbs when they're coming into bloom and regions with large numbers of bulb producers often use the blooming bulb fields as a tourist attraction. For example, in the Netherlands and also in the Skagit Valley in Washington. Some bulbs don't produce sufficient offsets for it to be a commercially viable propagation method. And a good example of this is hyacinth. A propagation technique that's used for some of these bulbs is scooping. Scooping involves the removal of the basal plate plus the growing point. Removing the growing point removes apical dominance and promotes the development of bulblets on the wounded surface of the basal plate. This is somewhat similar to the process of tip pruning an aerial stem on a shrub or herbaceous perennial in order to promote the production of lateral shoots. With scooping, the base of the bulb is wounded by literally scooping out a cone-shaped cone section with a curved or spoon-shaped knife. There's a very short video in Canvas for, for you to watch, which demonstrates this procedure and gives you a good idea of just how much of the bulb needs to be cut out. Really good hygiene practices 
and use of a fungicide on the cut surfaces are usually essential for scooping techniques. After scooping, the bulbs are placed upside down in sand or perlite or in open trays in a dark, dry environment at around 70 degrees Fahrenheit for a few weeks for callus to form on the cut surface. After callus has formed, the bulbs are exposed to higher temperatures of around 85 degrees Fahrenheit and about 85% relative humidity because this facilitates bulblet formation on the callus tissue. Depending on the species and size of the mother bulbs, around 30 to 60 bulblets may be produced. Spring blooming bulbs like hyacinth, which have been scooped and have bulblets attached, are then planted in late fall, upside down with the bulblets still attached and on the top. It takes three growing cycles for hyacinth bulblets to grow to about a four inch saleable diameter. In the photos on the right here, you can see hyacinth bulbs that have been scooped and planted. And the photo on the right is actually a tulip bulb that was scooped. And you can see the young bulbils produced on the exposed um, bottom side of the bulb there. Although you should note that scooping isn't usually a technique that's used with tulip bulbs. This is just for demonstration purposes. Let's look at scoring or cross cutting. This technique was first used in 1935 for Hippiastrum, which is a genus of bulbs native to South America. Hippiastrums can look very similar to Amaryllis species, which are native to South Africa, and the two are often misnamed in nurseries and on online on websites. Scoring involves making three to six vertical cuts through the basal plate, deeply enough to destroy the main growing point and again, like scooping, remove apical dominance. After the bulbs have been cut, they're given the same environmental conditions as bulbs that have been scooped. Scored bulbs typically produce about 15 to 25 bulblets. Chipping is another useful method of propagating true bulbs that are slow to produce offsets. Midsummer is usually the best time to do this with spring blooming bulbs such as Narcissus, Snowdrops and Dutch Iris. A mature mother bulb is cut vertically into equally sized wedges or chips, each including a part of the basal plate, as you can see in the photo on the bottom right here. The chips are treated with a fungicide and placed in bags with moist vermiculite or perlite. They're then incubated in the dark at around 20 degrees Celsius, so just under 70 degrees Fahrenheit, for about two to three months until bulblets form around the basal plate of each chip. In the fall, the chips with the bulblets attached are planted and grown on for about two years in a frost-free environment until the bulblets are large enough to be separated from the mother bulb. With twin scaling, a mature bulb is first cut vertically into wedges in the same way as the chipping technique described in the previous slide. The wedges are then further divided by sliding a thin blade, such as a scalpel, between every pair of concentric scale rings and cutting through the basal plate. Each of these pieces makes what's called a twin scale. So if we look at the photo on the top right here, you've got a, a wedge and this is clearly relatively old because it already has a bulblet forming between the scales. But if we wanted to make twin scales out of this wedge, then what we would do is count one, two scales from the outside and then we'd slide a scalpel blade between these scales and cut them off together with a piece of the basal plate. And then we'd go in two scales again, slide the blade in and make a cut. And then same thing again, right there. So 
That's what we do to make twin scales. After doing the cutting, twin scales are disinfected and grown on in the same way as the larger chips described in the previous slide. Twin scales can be really fragile and they're really vulnerable to drying out. With this technique, fewer bulblets are formed than with scooping or store, scoring techniques, but the bulblets are usually bigger. As you can imagine though, this is a really time consuming technique. If you're going to try twin scaling, I think it's good to practice first on relatively, relatively large and relatively cheap bulbs, such as daffodils. With non-tunicate bulbs, the individual scales can be separated carefully from the mother bulbs. The usual time to do this is after the bulbs have flowered and the foliage has started to die back. The scales are usually quite thin and it's important not to let them dry out. Use undamaged scales from the outer layers of the bulb as the inner scales aren't as productive. The removed scales are treated with a fungicide and then planted in a freely draining rooting medium with the basal end downwards. The scales should be planted to about a quarter of their depth. It may be useful to place a plastic bag over the top of the container or put a plastic dome over the flat to make sure that the scales don't dry out. Within about two to three months, three to five bulblets will form at the base of the scale, as you can see in the photo at the top here. These small bulblets should be grown on until they're of a marketable or plantable size. Many corms self-propagate in the same way as bulbs, producing new cormels each year. Corms are lifted after they finish blooming and the foliage has died back, and the new cormels can be separated from the mother corm. The photo here is of cro crocus corms clearly showing last season's mother bulb at the bottom right here, and the new cormels produced on top of that, and also to the side of some of these mother bulbs. You may remember from the previous unit that usually with corms, the mother corm is completely metabolized during the growing season and by this time of year is usually completely shriveled and not looking quite as um, full and plump as the, the corms do right here. Most rhizomatous plants can be propagated by division. The time of year at which this is done may be important for optimum success. For example, Douglas iris, Iris douglasiana, and the Pacific Coast hybrid irises are divided in the fall when new roots start growing. Bearded iris rhizomes, which you can see in the photo on the right here, are dug up in the summer after blooming's finished and they're divided into segments, each with at least one stem. Yucca filamentosa color guard that you can see in the photos here is a really popular architectural plant used in California landscapes. It forms a basal rosette of tightly spiraled, brightly variegated foliage, and each spring produces an upright branched stem that bears white bell-shaped flowers that are slightly fragrant. Below ground, this plant produces thick finger-like rhizomes that are about one and a quarter inches diameter. And there's a growing point at the end of each of these rhizomes. And you can see them in the photo here on the right with this sort of creamy yellow, creamy white portion of the rhizome, so there and, and there. Here's Yucca filamentosa color guard again with a close-up of the rhizomes. In the photo here, you can see the growing point at the end of this rhizome, even though it's not in focus, and the small creamy white dots just here and here are the eyes or lateral buds that will sprout and produce new shoots. 
Colour guard can be propagated by cutting the rhizomes into sections, as shown in the picture on the bottom left. Each one of these sections is about two inches long, although the one on the bottom looks a little longer than two inches. You could, you could treat the rhizomes with a fungicide before planting them, but I've never found it necessary to do so. If possible, I like to avoid using chemicals for environmental reasons. Also, why expose yourself or workers to chemicals unnecessarily? And if we want to be purely mercenary about it, not using a chemical is one less step of labour that has to be paid for and less money that has to be spent on a pesticide. These rhizomes, once they're cut, are planted about an inch deep straight into a freely draining potting medium. The rhizomes can be pretty slow to sprout though. If you're wanting marketable plants quite quickly, you can cut some of the rhizomes that already have a well-formed rosette of foliage on them. Many plants with tuberous stems can be propagated asexually by dividing the tuber into sections. Each section should contain one or more eyes, which are areas of meristematic growth, which are going to produce the new shoots. The cut surface is susceptible to infection by pathogens, so the cut sections are often stored in a warm, moist environment at around 68 degrees Fahrenheit to allow the cut surface to heal or suberize before planting. The photo here shows a very old hybrid begonia cabrillo, which has three very large stem tubers. You, re you may remember this photo from the previous unit. If we wanted to be cautious, we could just separate each of these three big tubers and replant them. If we want more plants though, we could cut each of these tubers into sections, remembering to make sure that each section has an eye that'll produce new shoots. So looking at these tubers here, I would probably divide this one on the right, just perhaps straight across the middle there, and then apply a fungicide to the cut surface so that it doesn't rot. And this one on the back looks like it probably has two eyes, maybe one here where these shoots are and another one over here somewhere that we can't see. So this one too could be divided in half. We might be able to divide this tuber into more than halves, but sometimes it's good not to be too greedy if you want to make sure that the divisions are going to survive. Caladiums are a popular foliage plant for lightly shaded areas and are a good example of a popular plant that's commercially propagated by stem tubers. The larger photo here shows caladium red flash, and the smaller photo shows caladium tubers that have already been divided and are ready to plant. This area at the top here, and here, and here, and here, are where last season's shoots and vegetative growth was coming from, and the eyes are these tiny little bumps here and those are going to produce the vegetative shoots for next season. And finally let's look at tuberous roots. You may remember from the previous unit that unlike stem tubers most root tubers have no buds so they can't be used on their own for propagation because they're not going to produce any shoots. However, the stems at the proximal end of the tubers do have buds. So a clump of root tubers, like this one on the right, can be propagated by dividing the tubers so that each tuber has at least one bud attached to it. The photo here shows a clump of tubers from a dahlia. You can clearly see the root tubers and the eyes at the base of the crown, which have already started to push on some growth. This clump could probably be divided into four or five tubers, each with an eye. So this tuber here could be removed right there with an eye. This tuber here could be removed so that it has that eye with it. 
and that's how dahlia tubers are divided. As mentioned in the previous unit, you can see that the amount of propagation material that you can obtain from one dahlia plant is pretty limited. So some growers propagate dahlias from stem cuttings as well as by divisions of the tubers. That ends this unit on the propagation of specialized storage organs. So let's summarize what's been covered. Most geophytes can be grown from seed, but the juvenile period can be as long as seven years, depending on the species. Seed isn't an appropriate propagation method for hybrid cultivars, so we have to use vegetative techniques. Tissue culture is used for the rapid multiplication of new cultivars and for the production of virus-free stock. But traditional vegetative propagation techniques are still used for many geophytes. For bulbs and corms, traditional vegetative techniques reduce the juvenile period compared to growing from seed, but they're really labor intensive. Many bulbs and corms self-propagate readily by producing offsets. No further propagation techniques are usually needed with these plants because the offsets can easily be removed and planted. Some bulbs don't produce offsets or only produce small numbers. So propagation techniques such as scooping, scoring, chipping and twin scaling can be used to promote the production of bulblets. These techniques all involve cutting the bulb and excellent hygiene needs to be practiced. The bulbs should be treated with a fungicide in order to optimize success. The wounded bulbs may also need to be given specific environmental conditions and the timing of propagation may be seasonal. Most plants that produce rhizomes or stem tubers can be propagated by divisions and plants that produce root tubers can also be divided but each root tuber also needs to include a section of the crown with an eye that will form next season's vegetative growth. So that's the end of this unit now. So head back to Canvas and when you have time, go take the quiz, which is going to test your understanding of the material that we've covered in these two units. Thanks for listening.